Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ben Thomas, and I'm with UST Training, uh, coming all the way from uh, Whidbey Island, Washington. Looks like we have people coming in from not only all over the country, but we even have some international callers as well. So welcome, everyone, aboard. Uh, with me is my, my friend and co-worker, uh, Chris Rodden. And Chris is there to help us um, uh, answer questions you may have. Please use the Q&A feature to ask questions. I'll be asking Chris to kind of moderate that. And I'm going to try to answer questions as we go along. Um, if there's some we can't get to, we will try to save them um, for the end. So let me jump in and say we, one thing I really want to do here, I, we use the word uh, tank savvy a lot. We want operators to be tank savvy. And admittedly, it is easily to be confused about what the leak test requirements are. There's all these different tests out there. Um, some person might have this type of tank system, another person might have another. And so it can be a little overwhelming. I'm gonna attempt, and this is the first time I've ever done this uh, webinar live. I'm gonna attempt to uh, present this information in such a way where it's maybe a little bit easier to digest. Um, I do a lot of operator training around the country. And what I've found over the years is that you can explain all this stuff, all the automatic tank gauge can uh, do a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak rate. But then when you go back and you kind of quiz everyone at the end of the day, sometimes I get these kind of deer in the headlights looks like, I don't know if I can keep all that stuff straight. So I decided to kind of break the whole set of requirements down into something that is hopefully easy to follow along. Again, if you're just joining us, uh, Ben Thomas here with uh, UST Training. We're gonna talk about being tank savvy and just really quick about me, don't wanna to brag too much, but I've been doing this underground storage tank work a long, long time. I was actually a state inspector in Vermont and from 86 to 87. I was a, a, a cleanup project manager for the Alaska DEC and then moved over to, I think I kind of finally found my, my calling in life and that is getting uh, people excited about underground storage tank leak prevention compliance. And so since 2002, it's been 20 years and a month, I've been on my own as an independent consultant and trainer doing UST compliance training stuff. And so my, cause my, my claim to fame is that I've trained more operators and for longer than any individual person in the US that includes both um, live and online tens of thousands of class AB operators in 35 ish states and we're pushing about three quarters of a million certified class C operators I'm very excited to have um, been a part of that initiative. <clears throat> for those of you who know me for the tank savvy minute I created the tank savvy minute video series I'll talk more about that at the end. And I'm also a, a currently a board member of PEI. I'm a member of Petroleum Equipment Institute, Sigma, Society of Independent Gasoline Marketers Association, and numerous state PMAs. I, um, I see based on the calls here today, we have all sorts of uh, qualifications and expertise. Uh, some people just starting, some people have been around a long, long time. So let's, let's jump in and talk about today's topics. Not all leak tests are the same. When we look for leaks at a UST system, the kind of leaks we are looking for and how we do them and what they mean and how to respond, they can be a little bit different. So operator training laws do require, you're supposed to know this stuff. I'm assuming I have a number of class AB operators on the line here today. There are leak test results that are have a leak tolerance of 0 0.1 GPH, that's gallons per hour. So imagine that's equivalent to about one Coke can an hour. And so you can have a 0 0.1 gallon per hour leak, you can have a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak, you can have a three gallon per hour leak. What's the difference? What, what does all this mean? And some leaks have no measurable gallon per hour amount at all. It can be confusing. There's all these different tests, all these different test locations, all these different kind of test equipment and all these different leak rates. So my job is to hopefully make it easier to you. When I, when I tell people what I do for a living, I, I tell them I'm a motivational speaker for gas station owners, which kind of you know creates a bit of a chuckle. But I'm, our goal is try to demystify all this stuff. So not only does it make sense, but you can also see why it is so important to do. So we're going to learn about each test. So what the test is, like, like how does this test work? Um, where the test occurs, some tests a test some tests happen in the line, some tests happen in the sump, some tests happen in the tank, some tests happen in the interstitial space of the double wall tank. What device does the test? It is important to know what, the, what system out there is gonna give you the signal that could mean a suspected leak in the system. And we're gonna talk about what size leak 
it can find. So a GPH means gallons per hour. I am pro promise not to use too many acronyms. UST, underground storage tank, and GPH, gallons per minute. Gallons per minute is typically the unit that we use, regulatorily speaking, to measure leaks. And I apologize, I see I've got a couple of friends here on the line here who I know are service technicians. I'm gonna be boiling this down into kind of language that is um, operator friendly, let's say. So if I oversimplify things, um, <laughs> my, my apologies up front, if I hopefully don't, yeah. Anyways, hopefully everyone, this will be the best for the biggest audience that's out there. So here we've got this underground storage tank system. We have a double wall tank. We have a tank gauge probe. We have a containment sump. We have a pressurized line and a automatic line leak detector. Let's say we are looking for a leak inside the tank. So we're looking for a leak inside the inner tank. This is a double wall tank, but we're going to be looking for a leak of product in the tank and the leak rate tolerance is 0 0.2 gallons per hour. If you came to work today and you have a passing leak detection test of 0 0.2 gallons per hour, it doesn't mean the tank isn't completely devoid of leaking. It's probably not leaking, but the leak tolerance is 0 0.2 gallons per hour. We use an automatic tank gauge. You would have an Incon or a Vita root or an OPW site send your automatic tank gauge is the machine that's going to drive the leak test. Now the leak test, and this is kind of important to know, the leak test is change in volume of fuel over time. And so the, um, the tank is basically shut down and uh, no fuel goes into the tank, no fuel gets pumped out, and we measure volume of fuel in the tank over time. A leak test of this type is volume change over time. If after the two, four, eight hour period that is required to run the leak test, there is no appreciable change in the volume, the tank is declared tight. Thinking you go on here. There can be two types of tests. And if you have a VITA route, you've probably seen the acronym CSLD, Continuous Statistical Leak Detection. That means the, the, the measurement of fuel in the tank is being measured many, many times right here. And so you're measuring lots and lots of little test results. When you have continuous testing, you test in between customer fill-ups, basically, because when you're testing liquid level in a tank, you can't be pumping at the same time. You can't be delivering at the same time. That messes up the test results. Some of you test periodically. The site is completely shut down. There is no fuel coming in. There's no fuel going out. So a change in volume over time can be done continuously or periodically. Again, any appreciable change in volume of the tank, you know, you start with a known volume, you end with a known volume, and if the volume is different, then it's suspicion that there may be a leak in the tank. And so the leak happens outside the tank. Let's pretend for a second this is not a double wall tank. Let's pretend this is a single wall tank. And so if you had a single wall tank and you failed a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak, somewhere where the tank has volume, there is a hole and that hole is causing a leak into the environment, which is what we don't want. And the leak rate is 0 0.2 gallons per hour. My, my, my dear friend, Marcel Moreau came up with this um, uh, visual years ago and I think it really kind of helps understand. And so if you have a passing 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak rate and it says pass, that means you're not leaking more than two Coke cans an hour into the environment, probably not leaking, but uh, possibly so. So my friend Joe here goes back to the tank gauge and finds a leak in the tank. The automatic tank gauge finds a leak. And so at you as an operator need to know that the tank gauge is the driver of this test. It is looking for a leak of 0 0.2 gallons per hour from the tank. Ben, not sure if you saw a couple things here from Juliana and, and Matt McCall McCollum. <clears throat> oh, um, in the uh, Matt, okay, Matt, is the leak test value based on, right? Yes. So 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak rate is the federal and state uh, re minimum requirement outside of California. So the 0 0.2 gallon per hour test was the, was this test standard that came up with the federal rules back in 1988. Is the 0 0.2 gallon per hour limit into account for precision accuracy limit of the method? Juliana, I don't want to get kind of too deep into that for a moment. There are some tolerances, um, which I'm not really going to talk about today, but 
the, these devices have been third party certified by an independent laboratory. And so um, you can't just create a tank gauge and say, I can find a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak rate. All these devices do need to have third party certification. I kind of don't want to get into that now because it's a little deep for today's talk. I'm happy to talk with you offline about it, but the method must be able to have a 95% confidence of finding the leak. And again, so the box is taken to an independent laboratory. They run a bunch of tests and they verify and they induce a leak and see if it can find the leak. And, and that, that is how this device can be legally sold and used for, for UST compliance. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. Let's say we have a double wall tank. And so we have a tank within a tank. We don't care how much volume of fuels in the tank. We care whether or not there's a problem in the interstitial space. And that's that little white uh, gap between the inner and outer wall of the tank. Basically any detectable change of, of, um, of, of the condition of the interstice is a leak. So it's not a gallon per hour thing. It's a, uh, it's a thumbs up or thumbs down kind of test. This is what we'll call tank interstitial monitoring. Again, there is a tank with a interstitial space here, and there's a little sensor down here looking for the presence or absence of a leak. The first one I'm gonna talk about is what's called the dry interstice. Imagine a tank with a dry sleeve all the way around it. And if the, if the and with a sensor in the bottom, if there is no presence of liquid, there literally is no leak. And so this is really just a thumbs up, thumbs down, a green light, red light kind of test. So any presence of liquid in the interstice is the test. We don't care, I don't know, you know, what the temperature of the fuel is, when the last delivery was, how full the tank was, none of that matters. It's all a matter of whether or not that interstice is dry. And a leak is a leak into the interstitial space, not necessarily into the environment, but it's captured in this kind of air sleeve around the tank. A leak, is into the, like I said, into the interstice and not into the environment necessarily. Any liquid in the interstice is considered a suspected release. If after class you go back to your site and you have a Vitaroot TLS 350 and it says L2 fuel alarm and you realize that L4 is the sensor down here, then you, pro you may have evidence of a suspected release in your system, right? So again, the tank gauge is what's gonna tell us what to do. The tank gauge says, liquid sensor alarm, and there is liquid in the interstitial space that the sump sensor has found out. So how do I say this here? The automatic tank gauge interstitial tank sensor finds the leak. It, it's, it's kind of a better test method because it's, it's, it's easier to perform. There's less variables that can kind of confuse or corrupt the method, right? And, um, and, yeah, it, it, it's it's just a more reliable method. The problem is a lot of people have the Vitaroot TLS 350 and they don't know what the L alarm means, L12345 alarm, and in case, unless you really know what that means. So this is a good method, but sometimes it fails because the operator doesn't know what to do with the signal. Another method of looking for leaks in between the inner and the outer wall of the tank is called a tank interstitial monitoring. In this case, it's gonna be a wet interstice. So imagine this empty airspace here around the tank is full of a salt water solution, and this would be a brine reservoir. And so any change in the brine level is considered a leak. So imagine a, a sleeve of fluid, of non-hazardous uh, unique identifying fluid around the interstice. And if that chamber reservoir stays the same, tank's tight. The tank cannot leak. Sometimes those levels do move a little bit. If it's a fiberglass tank, the shape of the tank moves a little bit. It could kind of move the levels around. But the idea, though, is that if there's an un if there's a unacceptable change in brine levels, then the tank has, the, the system has discovered a leak. And the leak, it, again, is into the interstitial space and not into the environment itself. And really, any change in the chamber level is going to be considered. Now, I, I know that there's some specifics about there's a, a little bit of a fudge factor allowed there, but any what I'll call any appreciable change in the brine fluid levels would be an indication of a suspected release. And uh, Nathan's yeah. got a, a comment question there at the bottom of the Q&A about this. 
Is there a way to determine if the leak comes from the inner or outer wall of an interstitial space? That's actually kind of a good question. Um, it can depend on, like sometimes, let me go back a second here. Sometimes water gets in here from the top. And so, um, best way to say this here, it, that can depend on a lot of things. If you have a sensor that can differentiate between fuel and water, it will indicate whether or not it's fuel or water. And so you could tell if uh, water has come in from it or if fuel is getting in. Personally, I think that it's it's pretty unlikely. It'd be, I mean, imagine this buried underground storage tank, right? It's in the ground. I mean, how in the heck could it get a hole in the bottom of the double wall tank? My, my, my suspicion is that most leaks are probably going to happen from inside of the tank where there's been wear or damage to the inner wall. So I think just kind of from a common sense perspective, it's probably likely that the leak is happening from the inside of the tank into the interstice versus having a hole in the outside, if, if that makes sense. That's yeah. That that's when we start kind of getting into the forensics thing. I don't know if I want to get too deep into that, but but th th there are ways to tell. Let me go back to here. Oh, um, so some tanks, right? Oh, so some tanks have a brine interstitial space, and again, the change in brine levels is an indication that a leak may have occurred. It may have gotten into the interstitial space. Again, we're looking for the change in brine levels in the reservoir chamber. So here's a case where there is a hole on the inside of the tank, brine starts appearing. I guess another way how to tell is that if your water level goes up, because this would be not fuel, but water. And so if you had a, a, a water float go off in addition to a interstitial alarm, that could be a secondary backup. And so our tank or automatic tank gauge interstitial sensor finds the leak. Now, okay, so we've talked about the volumetric leak test for the tank. We talked about the interstitial test method for the tank, both uh, wet and dry. Let's shift gears and talk about the leaks in the piping. We've learned over the years, I've heard this number thrown around many, many times, and I, I, it seems to be the same with everyone I talk to. Nine times out of 10, it ain't the tank. It's going to be somewhere in the piping, either in the tank top sump, or the under dispenser containment. And so if we are looking for a leak at the low point between the inner and outer piping, that is in what's called our containment sump. And so this is our low point here. Any liquid in the containment sump is a suspected release. A lot of operators didn't necessarily know this back in the day, but if there's presence of liquid in the containment sump, you have to check it out. Piping interstitial monitoring is what we're talking about. Any presence of liquid, in the low point of the system, whether it's an under dispenser containment sump or a tank top sump, is going to be a suspected release. A leak would have happened either somewhere between here and there, or maybe it happened below the dispenser. It's coming down this interstitial space. You see the line between the dash line and the solid line is, is an air gap, drops the liquid in, hits the sensor, sounds the alarm, and away we go. Any, the leak rate is any liquid. And so it's not a, again, it's not a gallon per hour thing. It's how much liquid is, is accumulated in the interstitial space enough to trip the sensor. You've probably seen many of these pictures before. We have an under, we have a tank top sump. We have a submersible turbine pump. We have a leak detector. We'll talk about that in a minute. We have a sump sensor. And here is our L1234 alarm, right? This, this containment sump is in fluid and it should be sounding an alarm, this is a suspected release. Likewise, with the picture on the right here, here's our uh, tank top sump, and it's kind of anchored down here, okay, at least it's vertically upright. It's in alarm, and so this thing should automatically be, um, this thing should be automatically investigated. The automatic tank gauge interstitial pipe sensor finds the, finds the alarm. So again, you go to your you go to your automatic tank gauge, you see the L1234 alarm, and you respond as a suspected release. The automatic tank gauge interstitial sensor finds the leak in the double wall piping. Now, 
in this is interesting. In 1958 or so, the submersible turbine pump gets invented. And so we're no longer sucking fuel. Oh, welcome back, Chris. We're no longer sucking fuel out of the tank. We are pushing fuel out with a submersible turbine pump motor. So 1958, the submersible turbine pump starts hitting the market. By 1961, we had invented the mechanical line leak detector, right? This little device here, the mechanical line leak detector looks for bad line pressure in the line. And when EPA wrote the rules, they contact the manufacturers in 1988 and they said, how big a leak can your mechanical line leak detector find? They said three gallons per hour. And that has been the federal and state rule ever since. Mechanical leak detectors can find a three gallon per hour leak. You may have a mechanical line leak detector. If you have a pressurized pipe system, you have to have a mechanical or an electronic one. And what it does is that it looks for low line pressure. And so every if you have a mechanical line lead detector, every time you uh, go to fill up your car, you turn on, you, you swipe your credit card, turn on the pump, it's just done a leak test. And if it can find a leak of three gallons per hour, it will give you an indication of that. So this is a low pipe pressure test. The mechanical leak detector is found threaded into the submersible turbine pump and it is looking for a big leak, a big leak, what, in, what the regulations call a catastrophic leak. And so if you're leaking at a rate of three gallons per hour, that's, that's kind of a big deal. Ben, I uh, lost my connection there for a moment. Okay. So I, I've lost some history on the Q&A, but there were um, some more questions going back to the, the interstitial monitoring before oh, you yeah, got into yeah. pipes. So just when convenient, just check those out. Yeah, um, so could a major flood cause water to get into interstitial space? Absolutely. I, th I think a lot of times, um, especially with double wall piping, right? You go to the service station, there's a big turbine lid. And if there's not a good sealant on there, it's really easy for rainwater to get in. I used to live in Juneau, Alaska, and all the containment sumps up there were always full of water because it was raining all the time. And so it is tough to keep water out. Water in a containment sump can be a, it is a suspected release. You do have to invest, you can't just say, well, it's probably just water. You do need to investigate that before you discount that. Uh, liquid interstites can indicate leaks from either primary or secondary tanks. Correct. Secondary tanks will lose fluid, not gain or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. But I, I wanna keep on going along with the mechanicals though. Um, we can circle back if there's still some questions in there. So again, our mechanical leak detector can find a, three gallon per hour leak. So if your mechanical leak detector is tripped, you're leaking at a rate of at least three gallons per hour. And this is a three gallons per hour under pressure test, okay? It's a three gallon per hour at 10, P 10, 10 PSI, 10 PSI. This is a big leak. And so for my operators out there who do not know this, if your mechanical line leak detector fails, you are watching for slow flow. There is a giant, uh, I don't know if you can see this, there's a giant spring here. Uh, a piston inside the mechanical leak detector, which will drop down if it finds a leak, it clogs the line. And now instead of getting 10 gallons a minute uh, into your vehicle, you're now getting three gallons a minute. And so your frustration leads to talk to the class C operator clerk at the store who calls their manager, who calls a service technician, and then they investigate that as a suspected release. So important thing to know about mechanicals is that slow flow means got to check it out, that that is a rule. So your mechanical leak detector finds the leak. The mechanical leak detector finds a leak, but it tells you because the customer is now frustrated. So just because the mechanical leak detector trips, you don't see anything. There's no tank gauge that tells you anything about that. You are simply relying on the frustrated customer to let you know that there is a potential slow flow, which could be a suspected release. Now there is another option for doing line pressure testing. If you have pressurized piping, you can have a device that looks for a three gallon per hour leak and a 0.2 gallon per hour leak and a 0.1 gallon per hour leak. That is called the electronic line leak detector. And so instead of having a mechanical one here, there is an electronic device that is controlled by the, by the Vita root or other tank monitor. And so your Vita root is constantly under surveillance and looking for a three gallon per hour leak and a 0.2 gallon per hour leak and maybe a 0.1 gallon per hour leak. Again, if there is uh, insufficient line pressure, then the leak detector alerts you. And so what's important to note here is that the electronic leak detector runs a test 
in between fill-ups. So you gotta have quiet time to run a line pressure test. The mechanical leak detector, if you get a, a slow flow, then you've discovered the leak, but the mechanical leak detector, I'm sorry, the electronic leak detector tests in between fill-ups. And so if there's a leak in between customers, the next person knows it. That's a electronic line leak detector. If you have a Vitaroot uh, TLS 350, you'll see the acronym PLLD, pressurized line leak detector, looking for low pipe pressure. Now it can be programmed to look for a big, little or tiny leak. Not everyone's site is the same. You could be looking for a three gallon prior leak. You could be looking for a three and a 0.2 and a 0.1. And so let's say you're programmed to do all three. And so you're always constantly 24 seven looking for a three gallon per hour leak. If there's enough quiet time, it will run a leak test on a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak. So it's going along, okay, no three gallon per hour leak. I'm gonna kind of dial it down and look for a smaller leak. And the system watches for that smaller leak. And then typically on an annual basis, it also tries to run a 0 0.1 gallon per hour leak. You could have one, two, or three of these options at your site, and you'd have to check your programming to make sure which, te which tests you were programmed to do. The leak rates can be a three gallon per hour leak, 0.2 gallon per hour leak, and a 0.1 gallon per hour leak. We like to say in the biz that your electronic line leak detector does all the minimum requirements for leak detection because you have to look for leaks in pressurized piping, what I say is pressurized piping is the source of most big leaks. And so you wanna have as much artillery as you can put into the leak detection for the lines. If you have a sump sensor and an electronic line leak detector, and yeah, if you have a sump sensor and electronic line leak detector doing three and 0.2 and 0.1, then you are doing all that is humanly possible to do leak testing for the lines. So again, here's our uh, electronic line leak detector. It finds the leak. The electronic line leak detector finds the leak. The Vitaroot tank monitor or whatever tank gauge you have will indicate what is the leak. And so your, your console is your driver, but this device here on the left is what's called your electronic line leak detector. Another option, I forgot to say this a moment ago, another option is to um, include a line tightness test. This is the case where a contractor comes in and actually pressure tests the line. So they valve off the line right here and they valve it off underneath the dispenser. They'll hook up a pressure device here and they'll overpressure this line. And so the overpressurization, basically you isolate the line, overpressure it with fuel in it, and then you watch for line pressure change. And if the line pressure does not change over time, the tank is declared uh, leaking. And so, but if the line is, so if the line cannot hold steady pressure, then a leak is suspected. Again, we're talking at only the, only the inner piping of the tank and uh, only from the turbine to where the shutoff valve is below the dispenser. A leak is in the line and the leak rate is 0 0.1 gallons per hour. And in this case here, I want to make a special shout out to my, my, my dear friend, Steve Rapport, who passed away a couple of years ago, and his uh, general manager now, uh, Frank, who works for Protanic. Uh, uh, Steve, for those of you who know, was, uh, was instrumental in getting people you know, excited in the biz about UST work. And so he's one of the companies that are out there that still today, even after Steve's passing, uh, they're out there big time. So the line tester is the person that finds the leak. So this is the only device, everything we've talked about so far is kind of built into your tank system. You don't have to do anything. It's there doing the work for you. This would be a case where the line tester comes up once a year and performs a line tightness test looking for that small leak. And got a few comments in the chat again. I don't know if this okay. is a good point to maybe look at those before you move on to something. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, surrender. Here, here's a great question. How, oh, how does a mechanical leak detector indicate is identified by gas station? So, um, Surrender, assuming that you have an automatic tank gauge, you could, the first thing you want to do is query the tank gauge because in the, in the functions, it will say whether or not there is an electronic line leak detector. This is actually a good uh, life hack uh, uh, thing, especially for inspectors. Go to the Vitaroot TLS 350, hit the function button a couple times. If one of the functions says start line test or start line pressure test, you have an electronic line leak detector. If it does not say that, 
then you are forced to assume there is a mechanical on site. The other way to do it is to open up the turbine sump lid and look down at the turbine pump when it is safe to do so. And you can look for that mechanical device. So if you see something like this, it's red, black, blue, green, tan. Um, if you see one of these threaded inside the turbine, that is your mechanical leak detector. Otherwise, go to the tank gauge, look to see if it's an electronic leak detector. And if there's not one there, then it has to be mechanical, if that makes sense. Oh, the, uh, Matt, the line pressure test is run at one and a half times the operating pressure. So whatever operating pressure the line normally operates on, it does one and a half times that. So they overpressurize the line to see if it holds that pressure. If we compare electronic to mechanical leak detectors, which is more efficient? Ooh, okay. Um, uh, Aditya, um, who's calling in from India, by the way, thank you very much, that's super cool. Um, both have their places in the world. Some leak detectors won't work under certain conditions. Um, if you have a very deep burial tank, your leak detector is so far down there that ambient head pressure will always keep it in the open mode. And so some cases a mechanical leak, detec leak detector won't even work. The mechanical leak detectors are mechanical, right? They're the, I mean, every time you buy gas, this little thing is, is, is working. And so if um, you're a super busy site, you can actually wear it out. And so it's likely you'll have to replace a mechanical leak detector more often than the electronic ones. I'm kind of a fan of the electronic ones because um, they're controlled by uh, electronic means, the, 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 um, the automatic tank gauge. And also you get no flow. So, and I think I forgot to mention that when the electronic leak detector finds a leak, it shuts down the pump. And so there's no question about whether or not a leak has occurred, you, you are forced to take action. So I think from a long-term uh, wear and maintenance thing uh, perspective, from a fact you can find multiple leak tests from the fact that um, it gives you a more, a stronger signal of, the, of a potential problem, I'd kind of put my money in the electronic leak detectors. Mechanical leak detectors do have their place, but again, they, they can't always work under certain applications. Oh, Rob May. Rob May said the Vitarut electronic line leak detector performs a three gallon per hour first, then 40 minutes later, a 0.2 if there's no quiet time. And if no dispensing, another 40 minutes, 0.1. Correct. Many electronic line leak detectors will not register a 0 0.2 gallon per hour teak to mid month. Yes. Yeah, so, important thing about leak detection is you have to have quiet time. You have to kind of stabilize the situation. And uh, Robert, thank, thanks for pointing that out. So, um, you do need to have enough quiet time in order for the test to kick in, but your system may not be programmed to run those 0.2 and 0.1 tests. So you have to just double check and make sure um, your site is set to do so. Could a mechanical leak detector used for motor spirit or diesel? Or... Oh, um, I don't know about today's market. For a while, there were leak detectors that were product specific. So there were diesel mechanical line leak detectors, there were gasoline electronic leak detectors. You do have to make sure that the leak detector you put in is rated for the fuel type. Uh, thank you for that, Aditya. There's a, uh, maybe uh, Ed Kabinsky, if you're on the line, I don't know if you can help me out with that, but the leak detector has to be rated for the type of fuel you have because some leak detectors are specifically formulated to a fuel type. And if you change fuels out, you also have to change the leak detector as well. These are some good questions here. Yeah, we've got a really great engaged group with awesome That's questions. Great. Thanks, everybody. And be, I wasn't expecting kind of getting to this level of detail here, but there is a national catalog of certified equipment that's out there. And thank you for that, uh, Ed. Uh, the National Work Group on Leak Detection Evaluation is a group of people out there. And I think, Ed, you are or have been on that team before. And they basically help gather up all the third-party certifications. And so it's kind of like all this material is warranted, if you will. All, this, all these equipments are verified by a third party. If you want to get kind of be next level tank operator, I'll send everyone a link after class that shows the uh, link. You basically go to this web page, you find your make and model of your, of your device, and then you can get a copy of that third party certification. That'll tell you what the tolerances are. So, so how do we kind of put all this into one simple table? So you can find a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak in the inner tank using an automatic tank gauge. That is our periodic or continuous 
leak test. 0 0.2 gallons per hour on the inside, on the inner tank of a double or single, well, uh, on the inner tank. If you have a double wall tank, you are looking for any leak rate in between the inner and outer wall of the tank using tank interstitial sensors. Likewise with piping, you can find theoretically any leak between the inner and outer pipe and the pipe is found in your you it, with sensors in either your tank top sump or your under dispenser sump. Come on. If you have a mechanical line leak detector, it can find a 0 0.3 gallon per hour leak on the inside of the inner pressure piping using a mechanical line leak detector. Again, mechanical line leak detector is mechanical. It's not electronic, doesn't talk to anything. And all it does is that it frustrates the customer who then talks to the clerk, who talks to the operator, who calls the contractor and away we go. Again, I, I'm. it has its place, but I, I would rather have more affirmative signals. The electronic line leak detector can find a three gallon per hour leak inside the inner pressurized piping. Again, using electronic line leak detector and it can find a 0 0.2 gallon per hour leak if programmed and there's enough quiet time, and it'll find a 0 0.1 gallon per hour leak on the inside of the inner pressure piping if it is programmed to do so. These are all internal methods to your site. And so all this equipment physically permanently resides on your site. The last method that is allowed, which is a good method, if you wanna find a precision leak of 0 0.1 gallons per hour, have a line tightness test done by a certified line tightness tester. So Ram says, so if I change my mid-grade tank to diesel, I have to change a mechanical leak detector also. Ram, you first need to find out what kind of leak detector you have. It may be rated for, I believe the electronic leak detectors Oh, so if you have an electronic line leak detector, you must reprogram the VTRU to say this line is now um, diesel and not gasoline. And so an important part of the programming would be to make sure that if you have an electronic leak detector, the VTRU or the tank gauge knows that information. If you have a mechanical leak detector, you just want to verify with the installer that it is rated for that type of fuel some leak detectors don't care what kind of fuel it is and some do. So again, check with your tank gauge programming if it's electronic and check with your uh, 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 certified installer if uh, you have a mechanical. Oh, uh, Mark says that is correct on leak detectors. Also like E85, the leak detector has to match the fuel. Fuels behave differently and the, the equipment today is sophisticated enough to where if you were just to switch product types and not tell the programming, it can miss a leak. So, which is actually why it's important, something I didn't really mention here today, all this, all your tank gauges and your sensors and your probes do have to be uh, uh, calibrated, certified, checked every year by a certified qualified person. Depending on what state you're in, it might be a licensed UST installer. It might be a, a, a vendor uh, 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 certified technician, but all this stuff has to be, I mean, we put a lot of stock into this equipment. And so, we can't just like plug it in and then go away and expect it to work for years and years. Every person on the line here today who has an automatic tank gauge should have had that device um, third party certified within the last, uh, well, at least once a year. Um, likewise, your sensors are checked, your probes are checked, the printer paper is good, all that stuff. And so we can't just simply have the stuff and walk away. It does have to be verified on an annual basis. All regulators on this group. <laughs> Rob said it'd be more precise to call this an inner tank instead of a primary tank. Or okay, primary tank. Okay, okay. We'll we'll let you have the one, Rob. Thanks. Uh, you should turn on the ATM tank testing even when using inner. Oh, okay. So Rob brings up a good point. I've got a double wall tank, and I do inventory leak test as well. So I've got a Vitaroot TLS 350. I've got double wall tanks. I'm going to do belts and suspenders technology. I'm going to do interstitial monitoring and a 0.2 continuous statistical leak detection. Absolutely. If you've got the capabilities to do both, there's really no reason not to. Oh, uh, Kathy asked, what is meant by catastrophic leak detection? Catastrophic was, was deemed to be a leak of three gallons per hour or greater, like <laughs> giant leak that's out there. Um, 
that the, we're seeing that the, the term was originally introduced by EPA back in the 80s. You don't kind of see much of it anymore, but it is a term used to describe a significant loss of fuel under a pressurized line. And Mike says, functionally, functional functionality testing should be part of the annual ATG certification. Correct. So we want to make sure the tank gauge is working properly. Have you ever encountered probes that have been hardwired to the system and could not be tested? Not me per se, but I'm not a certified tester. And so if anyone has any say, but I've never heard of a probe being hardwired. I mean, you should be able to disconnect them and pull them out and take a look at them, but I've not seen that. When changing fuel types, they also need to change the float kit. Oh, good. Thank you, Michael. So depending on the type of probe you have, well, is that true, changing fuel type? You need to make sure the float is certified for the fuel type that's in the tank for sure. I think those probes are somewhat universal. You gotta make sure it's programmed correctly. I hadn't heard that it's gotta be, make sure the float is the same as well. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that, Michael, thank you. How does this work with manifolded tanks? Uh, if you are doing, a, uh, this is the question from Paige, if you are doing a leak test with your automatic tank gauge, a 0 0.2 gallon per hour test, and you have periodic testing, not continuous then, or yeah, continuous, then you have to isolate those two tanks and, and test the tanks okay. individually. Um, that's the one instance where I think that would apply. Do electronic line leak detectors for an emergency generator tank shut off the flow of fuel entirely? Tim, I almost never see electronic line leak detectors on emergency power generators. They're usually suction piping, which I didn't really talk about today. If it's a suction pipe system, then the answer would be no, because you wouldn't have an electronic line leak detector in the first place. If you did have an electronic leak detector, it, it would shut off the flow of fuel. It might not be um, the best situation given the uh, urgency of the application of the use. Ed says, I've seen an overfill alarm, hard pipe to a tank and difficult to remove, but not a probe. So sounds like probe hardwiring, uh, people don't see that. Why sometimes is it observed that line tests pass through a numicator, but found to fail through another leak tester? Ooh. <laughs> um, I might rely on some of my testers to kind of go through some of that. Um, if if the one tank monitor was not calibrated properly, it could miss the leak. I guess that that's one thing. Um, some tank gauges look for smaller leaks in 0.2 gallons per hour. So it's possible one looks for a smaller leak and the leak was kind of in between the two levels. I don't know if anyone else has a question, has an answer about that. Okay, okay, Mark, gas and diesel have different float kits. Probes can be the same. Pro, okay, okay. E85 has to have specific floats and probes. We're back again to really, you gotta know what kind of fuel you got in the tank so that their equipment is, is set to be able to measure that correctly. And if you change product types, then it's really important that you make sure the hardware and the software has been updated accordingly. Thank you. Well, uh, Mike says, when you change your fuel type, you're more than likely have to notify your, um, your uh, agency having jurisdiction. And so, Okay, that's a good point. All sorts of tangential good stuff here. And so um, if you do change your fuel type, then the, a the UST agency governing your program would have to know that fuel type change so they can keep track of that. Don't, 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 don't just change your fuel and don't tell anyone. Michael Thornton said the probes are, okay, so the probes are universal. Okay, okay. Robert's uh, also got a comment there about the manifolded tank question. I, I don't know what CSLD is, maybe. Oh, that, that's a continuous, that what, what, who, whose question is that? Um, Robert commented on the manifold and takes question. I'm trying to remember, I'm scrolling up to see who it was that asked about manifolded tanks. There's so many coming in here. Let's uh -huh. see, where uh -huh, was it? You commented on it, but then he added that comment. So I thought you might just want to comment on his comment. Um, okay. okay um, ah, uh, I can't see. I can't see where the person's question here is with manifold of tanks now. But um, Ed Kabinsky did throw in electric. Okay, his opinion is electronic leak detectors are better for emergency generator tanks with pressurized piping. They can be set to just alarm. Mechanicals are not a good idea with pressurized piping. Thank you for that, Ed. And then uh, Robert confirming operating pressure for a line tightness test is one and a half times operating pressure. 
I've got all these like inspectors and technicians on the line. They're, they're giving me a run for my money. That's great. Electronic line leak detectors are now programmable only to alarm. Thank you, anonymous attendee, whoever you are. <laughs> Probes are universal. Manifold. Oh, it was Paige. It was Paige Fallon. I finally see it again. Oh, yeah. Oh, and also. How do these work with manifolded tanks was, was Paige's question. And then you commented on that, but yeah. um, and, and then there, and, there was and, another and, comment here about it. <clears throat> and, and Robert did correctly say that manifolded tanks are what are, you want to use continuous statistical leak detection if it's a Vita root or scald, uh, statistical continuous something leak detection if you've got a, a an Incon or a Franklin system. And Asynchronous? So, I don't know. What would that AV? I don't know. Just yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So I, I didn't really think we'd kind of go this far into the conversation. These are great <laughs> questions, though. Th th thank you for that. I was expecting to have like kind of largely operators on the room, but thank you for all my uh, technicians and uh, advanced operators and uh, inspectors for, uh, for asking a lot of these questions and, and, th and increasing the, the conversation. Thank you. Are there common age-related failure models that could be investigated or investigated, inspected prior to a failed test? So they're common age-related failure models. So in other words, Matt, you think you have a problem, but you're not sure, and so. It's age-related, so after, after some time, are there yeah. things that you can kind of suspect might happen or to be on the lookout for? Yeah, there, there are a few states that now require end-of-life tanks over a certain age. And so um, my experience has been that the tank itself, if, especially if it's fiberglass, is not gonna, there's not gonna be a whole lot of change going on there. The, the wear and tear really happens from the tank top on up to the dispenser. And so um, I know there, again, there's a couple of states that look to age as a um, indicator of potential failure wear and tear. I think they're mostly involved in the tanks and not the piping. Um, I, Matt, I'd have to get back to you on that, whether or not there's some additional uh, fit age failure models out there. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that one. Okay, okay. Yeah, Maine, Maine and Connecticut have teeth in their codification for age out. I think North Carolina did too, maybe. Robert May says, and I would agree, end of life is not nearly as important as the yearly functionality test. I mean, I've seen steel tanks come out of the ground that are 60 years old. They look great, right? I mean, they were they they did not corrode. They were put in well. It's more about the functionality testing of your equipment. That, that, thank you for that, Robert. That that's great feedback. Yeah. Ram says, if I have a third party SIR and past ATG report, am I supposed to do a line tightness test? I. I, I do so little with SIR. SIR, if it is allowed in your state, should be good for tank and line. If I were doing SIR because I didn't have double wall piping, so I would say, Ram, at a minimum, you could probably get away with SIR for the tank and the piping. It is not um, allowed for piping in the state of Oregon, if I remember correctly. Um, Personally, I would do a line tightness test regardless. If you're doing SIR, you probably got a single wall line and you want that extra level of protection. So whether it's required or not, I would do it regardless, personally. Ed, Ed and Robert piped in on that. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so no, you don't technically need a line test. I would recommend one as, as a risk uh, management procedure. Oh, for Texas. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would... So you wouldn't get in trouble for not doing it, but you increase your risk exposure by not doing it. I guess if that makes sense. Would you recommend preventative functional tests for mechanical leak detectors? My testers can weigh in here. I think once a year is plenty. Um, um, as you may know, COVID has affected so many parts of our industry. There are a shortage of testers. There's a shortage of testing equipment. There's a shortage of replacement parts. From a functional perspective, I think an annual test is fine unless you think if you, the one uh, difference, the one the one thing I, uh, Rohit, the one thing I would say, if you keep on getting a tripped leak detector, in other words, if this thing keeps tripping and giving you slow flow, then yes, do a, do a suspected release of a mechanical leak detector test. Otherwise, probably a year is fine. 
Uh, Charles Davis said in Texas, you do need to do a line tightness test if you fail two consecutive SIRs. Yeah, I didn't really get into SIRs in this talk here, but um, thanks for selling the line test. <laughs> um, yeah, some states um, are are cautious, if not suspicious, about SIR, which is a method I didn't talk about today. But a number of states do say, I think it's a federal law, if you have two consecutive uh, failed SIRs, then you do need to do a, a, a tanker line tightness test. Woo. I didn't think we'd get into this much kind of conversation here. I do want to kind of, what time is it now? I do want to kind of, oh, it's been almost an hour. Holy smokes, great conversation, people. Let me just kind of end with a couple things more. Um, as you probably know, we do online ABC uh, operator training. AB operators, if you've taken this today and have taken our training before, hopefully it kind of brings home a couple more points. Again, we try to deconstruct the stuff as best we can to make it uh, digestible, but, um, there's always something more to learn. So feel free to go to a usdtrain.com and learn a little bit about, about us. Um, if anyone here is gonna be going to the National Tanks Conference in Pittsburgh, or if you're going to the PEI show in Las Vegas, please look me up. I've got a booth and I'll be giving talks at both of these presentations. I'd love just to chat with you and say hi. And I love your feedback as to how today's webinar went as well. And, oh, I thought I missed, oh, you know what? Oh, and also uh, our famous YouTube videos, right? If you want to be more tank savvy, go to www.youtube.com forward slash, I guess I should fix this, <laughs> add, add one more T to this, Chris, right? UST yes. training. I put this slide <laughs> together at the last minute. Um, mm -hmm. So between our online ABC training, between our YouTube videos and or seeing uh, us in person, um, feel free to look us up someday. Oh, and uh, th thank you, Annette. Yeah. Oh, anonymous and attendee has something there on SIR. Yes, SIR is a fail is a suspected release to consecutive. Yes. Oh, that thank you. Confirms. Thank you for the clarification, anonymous. So SIR fail is a suspected release. Two consecutive inconclusives are suspected release. I wasn't really planning on going into SIR today, but <laughs> uh, thank you for the clarification on that. Took a whole village there to answer the question that came up on that. That's awesome. Will you have a presentation on the closure of single wall tanks nationwide? Huh? <laughs> I There's wouldn't mind seeing them all go away. I mean, I guess I could, <laughs> I guess I could do it. I mean, there, you, you don't have to. You don't have to get rid of single wall tanks, although it'd be my preference. Um, I'd rather get rid of the single wall piping first. That that'd be my biggest push. But Rob, that brings up a good point. If you have topics that you want to see me cover, uh, let me know. If 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 I can get a lot of traction here, we can maybe. I do some more of these topics that would be good for um, beginning, intermediate, and advanced people. And Ben, Kristen did join us at some point. I saw she's on the attendee list. I don't know if it's easy for you to make her a panelist, and then she could pop in and say hi, and people could see who. Uh, oh, great! Thank you. Who another person is that when you reach out to us with customer support questions for our UST operator training, you, you usually be talking to Kristen and I either on live chat, on the phone or um, through email messages. Um, you can leave a ticket and then we reply to you. And we really try to get back to everyone as quickly as we can, at least within a day, but you know, usually within hours. Hey, here comes Kristen. Great. There's hey, Kristen. Thank, thanks for joining again. Uh, Chris and Kristen hey. are my, my rock star team. We never, we get a question about, you know, I lost my password or how does this work or where's my worksheet or, you know, Chris and Kristen are our uh, rock solid people who help you get stuff figured out. So a special thanks to, to both of you for, for just, we're able to train a lot of people these days remotely. And hopefully even with this webinar, it feels like a little less remote because we've been able to interact um, over the web and have what I think was a, a really good, uh, com a much a bigger conversation than I was expecting to have. So again, uh, if you have a technical support question, you'll probably run into uh, Chris and Kristen here. And uh, yeah, th 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 thanks to you both for that. Yeah, don't hesitate. We're we're really happy to help you out. So don't right. don't ever Operate, hesitate. Operators There's are standing something by. else. Yeah, we are standing by. <laughs> oh, okay. So a final question. Again. So final question from Rohit. When monsoon, what monsoon protection would you like to recommend for USTs as water ingress is a painful issue? Your all the openings on your tank top must be sealed as much as humanly possible. So that means getting really good new modern tight seals padlock them. Um, your, your tank top sump should have both a lid and a cover. And ideally, this lid uh, should be bolted down or, or screwed down so you can't easily get into it. Um, 
Rohit, the, this area right here, see where that, that dirt is? This, this dirt should be clear and free of uh, debris and clogging so that if water does get in, it, it is able to drain alongside and or sometimes people put large rubber mats on top of the, on top of the uh, cover there to make sure that water doesn't get in. So you have to be a little creative here, but it's really about locking and securing all of your openings. And then this is where a lot of water comes in and makes problems. So you wanna make sure you've got a, uh, a cover, a lid, uh, proper drainage, and then maybe an additional mat on top. Oh, still got more questions. If we have a line tightness test passed and a report, report and passing ATG report, do we need to do 30 day inventory while having an inspection by UTA. Ram, what, what state are you in? Because some states do still require inventory reconciliation. So you could have a line test and a tank gauge pass, but, I, but um, one thing I didn't talk about today was inventory control. So I guess it would depend on what state you're in. Yep, fill caps and uh, probes caps, all for floods. Thank you, okay, okay. Okay, so a, a question on Chris, Chris and Chris, and we'll, we'll circle back and I'll leave some of these Q&As open so we can, um, we can um, um, circle back and see if there's some more topics out there. So for Ram, then you do need to do inventory control in addition to, let me think about this in Texas. You probably need to do inventory control in Texas in addition to another method, depending on the equipment that you have. I can't off the top of my head remember the Texas specific thing you can call me after class if you like. And that's got a comment about uh, for floods, fill caps and tank probe caps. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's there's water coming in these things potentially all the time, mm -hmm. and so this is just dirt here. If a little water gets in here, it'll just drain in. But these buckets do need to be kept clean and dry. But yeah, because water gets in a lot of these. Thank thank you for that. I think the last one here is Mike's got a comment, Mike Barone. Oh, okay, yeah, talking about hold downs. Yes, um, yeah, sometimes tanks do pop out of the ground. I've got a, I've actually got a great video on YouTube that shows in real time a tank just, you know, lurching right out of the ground. It's kind of mind blowing. So maybe, uh, I don't know if I could have a whole hour talk about that, but I'll figure out a way how to bring in the, 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 the hold down. Mike, if you haven't seen my YouTube video about how not to do hold down, uh, I'll send you a link to that afterwards. Ed's got a nice um, yes. uh, confirming comment here too. Texas, Connecticut, Maryland, Delaware do require inventory in addition to a couple other states. Well, I really appreciate everyone joining us today. It's been a um, it's been a super cool um, uh, conversation. I'm I'm really impressed at the level of questions that we had. When you do something that's open to hundreds of people, you know you never never know who you're going to get. So thank you for all of our uh, service technicians out there, our inspections with our inspectors with their uh, great questions. I will be recording this and making it available probably on YouTube in a little bit. So if you want to share this with your friends and I'll maybe at some point I'll re record a cleaner version uh, that just is just a straight talk. But anyways, this has been a great conversation. Thank you everyone for attending. Maybe I'll see you in Pittsburgh or Vegas. Uh, maybe I'll see on, you know, send me your comments, so subscribe to us on YouTube. And if you need uh, ABC training, uh, give us a call. I think with that, I'm going to. Thanks again for coming everybody.